Amen. Okay. Uh, if you're in your text, go ahead and be in 2 Kings 24. We'll, we'll start there. We're going to kind of go back to the beginning of, of that chapter. Uh, 2 Kings 24, uh, Jehoiakim, uh, who is the uh, second of Josiah's sons to rule over Judah. Jehoiakim is king, and recall that he was uh, faithful at first, however that did not remain. But even in verse 1 it says, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. And so that is the first time in which Babylonian forces enter into Judah and, and take even captives away. And who was it specifically that we know was taken captive at that time? Daniel. Okay. So that was uh, was one of the things that we we talked about briefly on Wednesday night. Even looking at the chief point of Daniel uh, and all Daniel's prophecies as he is in captivity, serving in first the Babylonian court, and then of course later on, after the captivity is over, even serving in the Persian court. And yet God's messages through Daniel have a a common theme to them, and that is that God is the one who is orchestrating all this. God is the one who is in control uh, of world events. Chapter 2, one of the better known passages dealing with that, as Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of this image in four parts, and I'm just kind of looking at the first part of that vision as Daniel is giving Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation And he says, you, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and calls you to rule over them all. Now, that idea has ramifications later on in the book of Daniel, for we come to chapter 4, and we see Nebuchadnezzar being humbled, and it's because Nebuchadnezzar failed in that moment to remember this, to to recognize that it is God who had exalted him. But the point that we're making here, and we're going to be making it a few times this morning, as we have seen the the fortunes of Israel and Judah wane, and we have seen them become an afflicted people, we've seen other empires rise, we've seen the Assyrians, we've seen the Babylonians. Within these texts, within the prophets in particular, God is making this point, I have done this. I am the one who has exalted first Assyria and used them for my purposes. And I am the one who has now exalted Nebuchadnezzar and I have made him king over all things. And even in Daniel chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, it talks about how the Lord gave Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. This is God doing this. Well, beginning our, our study today... Jehoiakim uh, ruling as king. But the text says in in verse 1 that he rebelled against him. Now, looking later in the text, perhaps we get an idea of why uh, Jehoiakim would rebel. And even just asking, let me ask the question, looking at what we've already seen with these kings, why would a king of a much smaller nation, Judah, a much weaker nation... Why would a king like Jehoiakim decide to rebel against what is clearly a superior force and a mightier force? Yeah, so Brother Steve is exactly right. Now, perhaps earlier in their history, if we look at why God's people would defy the nations, we could say, well, it's because they trust in God. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so Hezekiah can you know, stop paying tribute to the Assyrians and because he trusts in God, and God ultimately delivers Jerusalem from the Assyrians. That is not the case with Jehoiakim, though. There is no trust in God. There is, there is no thinking, oh, you know, we're going to follow God, and because we're following God, God is going to deliver us. I think Steve's exactly right. Where Judah is, where Palestine is, and we've looked at a map before in this, it is right between these two dominant powers. It is right between Babylon to the north and then Egypt to the south. Even looking further in the text, now this is when 
it's the stated anyway when his son Jehoiachin is reigning. It says in verse 7, The king of Egypt did not come out of his land again. For the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Uh, so all that territory that Egypt had once possessed and Egypt had in- exerted influence in Palestine over Judah and Israel, the text is saying Babylon has taken that. And at this point, Egypt's not even trying to come out from their borders, trying to come out from the Nile area. Uh, They are not exerting any kind of influence in the land at this time. So, Jehoiakim, though, has hoped. He, He has thought, oh, this other powerful nation, they will help us. They're gonna be with us, and so we can rebel against the Babylonians. Well, we already looked at how the king of Babylon initially responded to this. Um, he sends his bands of raiders against them. But in December of 598, the king of Babylon gathers his forces and he marches from Babylon. And it just so happens, at the same time, Jehoiakim dies. Now, we're not told how it is that he dies. Um, we read earlier in a previous class from Jeremiah chapter 22 that it talks about how he was going to have the burial of a donkey. Uh, so he's not going to be uh, lamented when he passes. He's not going to have a, a stately burial. Uh, and it may even be the fact that uh, one of these raiding bands, if he led a force out against them, he could have been killed in battle and dragged off like a donkey. Uh, that may very well have been what happened to Jehoiakim. However, it leaves his son, Jehoiachin, we should have probably Jeopardy one night just to, you know, say, okay, who can remember which king is which, you know, because the names are all kind of similar. Um, it leaves Jehoiachin, who's very young, in quite a state. He comes to the throne, and Nebuchadnezzar is already on the march. He's already coming. He is going to subjugate Judah once again. He is going to put uh, the king under his thumb. So the Babylonian forces come, and what does Nebuchadnezzar do with Jehoiachin? Yes. And in fact, he doesn't leave him in Jerusalem. Um, The text kind of gives an indication uh, again, of how the, the Judean king at this point kind of sees himself. He, he knows he, he is not going to be successful here. Uh, so the Babylonian forces are besieging Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar come, comes, and the text states that Jehoiachin and his mother and other officials, they go out to the king. They're, they're not thinking at this point, we can hold out. They go out to the king. Nebuchadnezzar takes all of them captive. And more significantly what it says of of the rest. So looking in verse 12 of chapter 24. Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his captains and his officials. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. That is the eighth year of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. Then he led away into exile all Jerusalem, and all the captives, and all the mighty men of valor, ten thousand captives, and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. Now, those who have been in the class... What does this remind us of? What, what prophecy foretelling of doom does this bring to mind? Remember, what did Hezekiah do after his recovery from his illness? The Babylonian emissaries come and Nebuchadnezzar shows them all the treasures of the house. The word of God to Hezekiah was, all these treasures that you have shown are going to be taken to Babylon, along with some of your own sons. We've already seen a partial fulfillment of that. Uh, Daniel and others who were taken at the same time are of the nobility, so they've been taken captive. Some of the treasures from the Lord's house have been taken already. But you see in this passage, they're much more thorough now. 
I mean, they are stripping the gold off the temple to take it back to Babylon at this point. So they're taking all the treasures, they're taking thousands of captives back to Babylon. When we come to it in the next class, we're going to see they even go to greater lengths to strip the treasures and anything of value away from the temple before they ultimately destroy it. But they're taken captive. Jehoiachin and his family are taken captive as well. Now, there are some indications that um, those who were taken captive and maybe even those who remained in the land still view Jehoiachin as the rightful king. But we looked at 2 Kings 22 in a, in a previous class. Uh, again, we, we kind of saw in that passage where it talked about how Jehoahaz would never come out of Egypt. And it talked about how Jehoiakim, and we, we read that passage about how he was uh, really rebuked by the Lord for building his own splendid house in the midst of what was really a trying time for God's people. And then it talks about how the people would not lament him and that he would be uh, having a burial of a donkey. And then it goes on to talk about Jehoiachin, referred to as Kaniah here in Jeremiah 22, but this is the most significant part of it. Thus says the Lord... Write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So the man who is viewed probably as the last legitimate king of Judah, and the prophet says he will not have an heir to rule in Judah. Now, this, we're going to kind of pave the way for some things we're going to look at in our last couple of classes. Let's say you're part of the faithful remnant. You're part of the remnant of the people that, that still are, are holding true to God, even though you know, there's so much sin and iniquity. What are some of the promises that you've been holding on to during this time? Return and a king. Okay, because what did God promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7? Yeah, you're, you're always going to have a descendant reigning on the throne. I'm going to establish your house forever. And Jeremiah has just said, it's not happening through this line. So you're a faithful part of the remnant. And that would cause maybe some confusion on your part at first, before you begin to hear some other of the prophecies uh, that God is going to give through Jeremiah. This is the line of David, and you're saying this line is coming to an end. Well, it is in this physical, political kind of sense, but we'll, of course, come to the, the ultimate spiritual fulfillment. Steve? Well, you and I have had this discussion earlier. <laughs> Jesus is being the opposite of Jeremiah. Yeah. In one sense. Yes, yes. So, to me, this says one of two things. Jesus is never going to rule on a throne in Judah, which would kill these people who think they're going to come back and rule the nations in Israel. Right. And second of all, it just proves that Jesus, in the true lineage, his father was God. His father was not the king. Yeah. Yeah, so didn't hear a lot of that. Uh, we're, we, we'll come back to this again when we, we talk about some of the hope that Jeremiah uh, gives in his prophecies. Jesus descends from David really by two lines. There is the line of, of Joseph, but of course Joseph is not the literal father of Jesus. He is the, the father from an earthly standpoint. But Joseph descends from Kaniah. But God has said through Jeremiah, none of Kaniah's descendants are ever going to reign. And as Steve says, you know, Jesus certainly would never reign over a, a, a physical throne in the first place. But his descendant through Mary is from a different line. It's not, it's not through that, that kingly line. So 
anyway, the promises are going to be fulfilled to Abraham, to David. All these things are going to be fulfilled in Jesus, but it's not, it's not in that royal line uh, that, that we think of. So we'll come to that uh, in a little bit later. Any other questions or comments at this point? All right. Just to also get a sense, um, so this is 597, uh, where the second wave of captivity has, has occurred. And again, we see in this one, this is a, a much larger uh, taking of people. Only the poor of the poor are left in the land. Now, what the Babylonians do, which is different than the Assyrians, the Assyrians, when they took captives, they dispersed them broadly. The Babylonians would tend to, anyway, oftentimes, uh, resettle populations together. And what we know is that at least one of these resettlements uh, of those who were taken captive from, from Judah is at the river Kibar in, in Mesopotamia, right there, very close to, to Babylon. Now, who do we know was among those captives? Daniel was in the first wave, but that's it's not, not far off, though. Not far off. There's another prophet we know of that's in, among these captives. Ezekiel. You had the right letter, E. All right, so Ezekiel is among these captives. Um, and I want you to just kind of note what is still true of these people. So let's turn over to Ezekiel, and let's look at Ezekiel 2. Ezekiel 1, uh, Ezekiel sees this, this vision of God and His glory and his, the messengers who are with God. But I just want to look at a, a few verses here in Ezekiel chapter 2 to kind of give us the impression of what's really going on with His people. Uh, this is, again, a people that have been experiencing the covenant curses from Deuteronomy 28 for years and years and years. And God has been doing this to try to bring the people back to their senses. Well, now they have experienced the, the ultimate and final covenant curse. They've been taken out of the land. The land has spewn them out. So God says to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 2, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And they spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel. To a rebellious people who have rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, as for them whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Ezekiel is not being sent to the people who are still in Judah. You go back to chapter 1 and verse 1. He is among the captives on the river Kibar. And God is saying, this is still a stubborn and obstinate house. And if you read Ezekiel, I think you even kind of can see there, there's a change in the letter. That when you come up to the point of the temple being destroyed... Ezekiel is working among an obstinate people, a, a rebellious house. Even though they're in captivity, they're still rebelling against God. But it's when the temple is going to be destroyed, then we begin to get to some messages of hope. And maybe that was a turning point uh, for the captives, that their, their final hope, this temple of God where, where God supposedly dwelt, um, that's no longer present in Jerusalem. So now they begin to turn back to God, which will then, of course, allow a return later. Okay, one other, let's see, was it here? Let me get to back to my notes here. Yeah, one other thing from this time, look back in Jeremiah chapter 24. Jeremiah chapter 24. Pretty short chapter. Um, I'll just kind of paraphrase. So again, Jeremiah of all the prophets kind of gives us more chronological data. And this is at the time when Jeconiah was, was taken captive. And, and what God shows to, to Jeremiah are two baskets of figs. And one is a good basket of figs, and one is a, a bad and rotten basket of figs. Anybody know what God is saying, what, what the good figs are? Kind of a 
something you wouldn't expect. God says the good figs were those who were taken captive. That ultimately those who were taken captive were going to experience renewal and ultimately be blessed by God. So if the good figs were those who were taken captive, who were the bad, rotten figs? The ones who were left behind. The ones who were still in Judah. And, and so right here we see, okay, things are not going to get better because uh, these people will not repent. This is going to get worse and worse for those who remained back in Judah. Well, once... Um, Oh yeah, one more thing. Forgot about that. So around the same time as well, Jeremiah writes a letter to these captives. Jeremiah 29 is a pretty, pretty important passage uh, as far as studying this time period. And it's set, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, there have been false prophets, and maybe this helps us understand why God even says to Ezekiel, the captives you're going to prophesy to, they're obstinate. They're rebellious. Because there were people who were claiming to speak for God who were saying, two years and you get to go back home. Now, this is just temporary two-year time frame, and then God's going to strike down the Babylonians, and we'll all get to go home, and everything's going to be fine. And again, remember, the temple's still standing at this point, so that's probably the, the reason for their false hope. Well, Jeremiah writes to the captives, and what does he say to them? It's not, in, it's not in this passage. What does he say to them about how they ought to begin to conduct their, their everyday life? Yeah. He said, here's what you need to do. Build houses. Farm the land. Start a family. Well, you wouldn't do that if you're only going to be someplace in a foreign land for two years. Why, why go to the trouble of building a house? Why go to the trouble of developing the land? You're, you're, you're only there for a short time. But thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I'll visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. You'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. This passage continues to emphasize the covenant faithfulness of God because as we've been looking at in our, in our state of the divided kingdom, God's people are suffering the curses of breaking their covenant. And again, you can read Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and you see how all this is coming to pass. Exactly what God said would happen is happening because they have broken their covenant. But God had also said within the law in Deuteronomy chapter 30, when you turn to me, I'll bring you back. When you repent and come back to me, I will restore you. And so even here, and even though we're pretty early into their, the time of their captivity, God's word through Jeremiah is, okay, there's going to be an extended stay. You're going to be there 70 years. But then you're going to turn back. And when you do turn back, and when you pray to me, I'm going to do exactly what I said. So never forget that when we study what is a, a fairly bleak period of biblical history. And we do get impressed with the covenant unfaithfulness of God's people. And that's a lesson we should take to heart, you know, not, not breaking our covenant, not violating our covenant. But the greater lesson in all this remains the faithfulness of God. God keeps covenant. God is true to his word. So whether it's the, the meeting out of the punishment that he warned, he kept his word, and when it comes to fulfilling the promises and restoring and hearing and forgiving, God forgives his word. I'm sorry, God remembers his word. Uh, and so that continues to be our hope too. When we find ourselves in sin, we find ourselves slaves to sin again, captives to sin again. What hope do we have? 
We have a God who hears. We have a God who restores. That's who He is. So we can take all those things to heart. Any questions, comments before we move further? All right. Oh, yeah, Steve. Absolutely. All right, well, we're going to talk now about the final king of Judah, Zedekiah. Um, we're not going to do all of his reign today, because when we come to Wednesday night, we'll spend a little bit more time just looking at how Jerusalem is destroyed, and that, of course, is under uh, Zedekiah's watch. So much like Jehoiakim had been made king of Judah by the Pharaoh, Well, now Babylon has exerted their influence over Judah. They have deposed Jehoiakim, and now they've taken, rather, they've taken Jeconiah captive. uh, And now the Babylonian king raises up yet a third son of Josiah, Mataniah by name, but then changes his name to Zedekiah. And now he is going to be ruling over Judah for a period of 11 years. We don't read a whole lot about what happens in those 11 years because it gets fairly quickly to the point that he's going to rebel also, and that is going to be what brings about the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple by the Babylonians. There are a couple of things, though, that the text mentions about his wickedness uh, that I kind of want to delve into a little bit. So the first thing is what is found in 2 Chronicles 36 and in verse 14 where it says that all the officials of the priests and the people were very unfaithful following all the abominations of the nation. So we still see that even though this is a people that are being chastened by God, they've experienced captivity, or many of them are experiencing captivity, yet these bad figs that God describes them as do not turn back to God. And specifically it says they defiled the house of the Lord which He had sanctified in Jerusalem. Now we have certainly seen this occurring in the reigns of other kings as well. We talked about it with Ahaz, we talked about it with Manasseh, um, but now Zedekiah, under his reign, the house of God is defiled. That in mind, turn over to Ezekiel chapter 8. Because again, this is somewhat of a turning point, uh, or at least getting to that turning point within Ezekiel's message to those who were captive. Ezekiel 8, and remember, Ezekiel is in Mesopotamia. He's not in Judah. He's not in Jerusalem. He's in Mesopotamia. He's working among the captives in Mesopotamia, in Babylon. But in a vision, he's transported to the temple. It came about in the sixth year... On the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell on me there. He goes on to talk about how the Lord looked and how God brings him to the north gate of the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 5, he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. It doesn't specify why it is, but an idol of jealousy. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations with the house of Israel are committing here, so that I should be far from my sanctuary? Yet you will still see greater abominations. He brought me to the entrance of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing there. So 
So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel, with Jazaniah the son of Shaphan, standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand, and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. And the Lord goes on to talk to Ezekiel, asking him, do you see what they're doing, you know, worshiping all these carved images? He says, you'll see greater abominations. Verse 14, he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which is toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. He says, you're going to see greater abominations than this. Verse 16, behold, the entrance of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. That's what's happening during the days of Zedekiah. That's what Ezekiel's prophesying. And in this vision, I don't think this is any kind of symbolic vision. I think, I think Ezekiel is taken back to the temple and seeing exactly what is going on in the temple in the days of Zedekiah. Now, those of you who are familiar with your text in Ezekiel, what happens in the chapters immediately following this? So God takes Ezekiel back says, I want you to see what they're doing to my temple. And what is the end result of this? Yeah. So there's this message of judgment. God is going to slay the wicked. But then as Steve says, in both first in chapter 10, it talks about how his presence leaves the temple. And then in chapter 11, the Lord's presence goes to the east, the eastern. So God has not only left the temple, He's left Jerusalem. What would be the message to the, the captives? Remember, Ezekiel, is, he, he's seeing this vision and there are, there are elders of the people in the room with him. What, what should they be taking from this? Yeah, so that's the message of hope. You know, when this temple is going to be destroyed, God's not destroyed along with it. God wasn't there. But to get to the message of hope, you have to get to this rebuke first. Because again, these are a people, and you read Jeremiah chapter 7, and, and God even you know, is warning them, don't keep saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, as if this is some kind of rallying cry. Oh, the temple's there, we're going to be okay. No, no. This is what you're doing to my temple. And so in this vision, God's saying, I'm not there anymore. You think everything's going to be okay because the temple of the Lord is there. I'm not in the temple. I left. I've left Jerusalem. And so when it's going to be destroyed, it's going to be destroyed because God's not with them anymore. And he's trying to impress the people with that at this point. Yeah, Steve. Yes. In First Kings eight mm -hmm. verse eleven, when Solomon finishes the house of God, it says, "The glory of the Lord yes. fills the house of the Lord." Yeah. In Ezekiel ten eighteen, it says, "The glory of the Lord departed yeah. from the temple." And I, this may be a stretch on my part, but in oh, forgive me, in Luke the second chapter, when Simeon sees Jesus and his parents come into the temple, he says. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And to, to explore this tangent just a little bit further, so Steve accurately says, Tabernacle is constructed, Exodus 40, glory of the Lord fills it. Solomon's temple is constructed, glory of the Lord fills it. There's another temple that's constructed in the days of Zedekiah. Ezra refers to this. You don't read about the glory of the Lord filling it. You never read a passage similar to Exodus 40 or 1 Kings 8 where it says how the glory of the Lord filled that temple. And so maybe exactly what Steve was saying when Simeon sees Jesus come to the temple. Oh, now here is the glory of the Lord 
coming back to the temple because it didn't come in the same way in the days of, of Zedekiah. But that's, a, that's another tangent, but it's an interesting one. All right, one other thing, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish up today. One of the things said of Zedekiah, he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear allegiance by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. So two things are mentioned here. First, he did not humble himself before Jeremiah. And then second, he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Well, the two go hand in hand. Go over to Jeremiah 27. Jeremiah 27. We won't take time. You can also look at Ezekiel 17, uh, where Ezekiel becomes aware of the fact that, yes, there is a, a plot being hatched to rebel against Babylon, and Ezekiel says this is not going to be successful, which it certainly was not. Jeremiah 27, and we'll pick up in verse, we'll start in verse 1, then we'll pick up some other verses. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourself bonds and yokes, and put them on your neck. And then he's told to go ahead and send word to the kings of surrounding nations. And the reason for that is that these would be the nations who would try to provoke Judah to join them in alliances against Babylon. But God says, verse 5, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now I have given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make them, well, sorry, make him their servant. He goes on to say, It will be that the nation of the kingdom which will not serve him, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with a sword, with famine, and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have destroyed it by his hand. Okay. So immediately the point to Zedekiah is don't rebel. Just as we began this class looking in Daniel chapter 2 and how God has said to Nebuchadnezzar, I have made you king of kings. I have made you, you know, ruler of the earth, basically. Now God is saying the same thing to Zedekiah and these other nations. Don't rebel. God is the one who has raised him up. And it's interesting. He says, this pleases the Lord of the one whom the Lord is pleased with. Do not take that to be a, a moral um, pleasing of the Lord by Nebuchadnezzar. That, that's not the case. The point is, the Lord was using him for his purpose, and God's saying, don't rebel against him. I think there's some application we can make. I think there's some application that, that Christians could always make. Remember when Paul writes to Christians in Romans 13 and telling them to, to submit to the government, to give honor to those who are in authority. What's his reasoning for saying this? Because who is it that appoints rulers and leaders? Is God. God raises them up. Nero is, is Caesar at the time that Paul writes this. this is a, you know, if Nebuchadnezzar was immoral, Nero takes that to an exponential factor. Okay? This is not a godly person. Yet God says, don't resist them. I think that's something we need to remember. Is we, we continue to live in a secular society with rulers that we don't much care for with rulers who do not match up to what we would view as moral. God's people have almost always lived under immoral rulers and leaders. What's our task? Be faithful to God. Be faithful to Him. It's not, not my task to figure out, okay, here's how the world needs to be run. I don't know why God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know why God raised up Nero. I don't know why God has raised up so many rulers in the world. It's still my task to live here faithfully to him. But Zedekiah is not going to listen to that. Uh, Zedekiah is not going to yield. 
And so we will see how that results in the destruction of the city where God calls his name to dwell and the temple, the house where his presence was to abide. Thank you, everyone. We will pick up there on Wednesday evening.